Hey there, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday morning. It is such a beautiful, beautiful day out. And here we are. We get to gather outside. We're thankful for this space where we can gather. Welcome to everybody online. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. And um, as we get started, I just want to read a scripture to you. A familiar scripture that, that calls us to trust in the Lord. And uh, listen to these words and let them soak into your soul. Psalm 23, it says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemy. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Will you join me in prayer as we begin our service? Lord Jesus, we welcome you here into our hearts, our homes, and into this place. I pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified through the worship, through the words, the preaching, through your people making time for you. Lord, I pray that you'd bless every heart, every soul, every mind, every person, right now, wherever we are. I pray that we would be filled with your spirit and guided by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Praise God. Uh, as we get started today, I want to let you know a couple of things. First of all, stay connected with us on social media. You know, our, 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 um, on our Instagram is Victory Anaheim on Facebook, um, Victory Baptist Church. And on, uh, you can also follow mine, Lanto David on Instagram and David Lanto on Facebook. And uh, try to stay connected with our church and kind of let you know what's going on. And, and we also use email to, to get announcements out. If you're not on our email list, send us an email to info at victoryanaheim.org. And we can put you on our weekly email list where we get you connected with what's going on, what's happening um, on a week-to-week -week basis. Something to put on your radar. I know Thanksgiving's coming up. It's going to be a, a, a beautiful time, and I know it's going to be a different time of Thanksgiving for everybody this week. Whatever you're doing this week for Thanksgiving, find a way to express your gratitude in the name of Jesus. Um, I know Brian will talk a little bit more about that next week when he preaches. And, and, um, but put on your radar within sometime soon we're going to gather at our property at 227 north magnolia um, to gather just to pray we're going to gather there on our site um, the flattened land and just pray as we as we about and dream together about what what's going to be built there and so just uh, we don't have a date for you yet but it's going to be on a saturday so just kind of be ready for that and we'll, we'll get the word out to you at least a couple of weeks in advance now I want to invite everyone to worship with us as uh, Peter and the team, as they lead us into the presence of Lord, worship with us. If you're able to do so, please stand as we uh, worship.
Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Excuse me, Chelsea. Hey there, I apologize to you guys here live. Forgot to tell you, the lyrics are on our website, victoryanaheim.org. You'll see it, song lyrics, on the face of our, of our website. If you go there on your phone, and the lyrics to the songs are right there. My apologies to you. Doing it outside, we can't put a screen up. You wouldn't be able to see it, so it's a little bit different. But go to the website, and you can see it, the lyrics there. My apologies. You guys at home, you guys have the lyrics, I think. But, um, okay, so we're going to take a, just a few moments to um, give back to the Lord. The Lord is good, and giving back to God is one of the practices that, that God's people have always done. Um, we say, Lord, thank you for who you are. In, the, in biblical times, they practiced the tithe, and, and they, would, they would, in their harvest, as they, as they, as they, uh, as they uh, cultivated their crops, when the harvest came in, 10% they gave back to God. Um, 10% of their flocks, 10% of their harvest, 10% of their livelihood back to God. And um, I've been challenging people that if you've never taken on the practice of tithing to take the 90-day challenge to begin tithing, and see what God does over 90 days if you trust him for three months to tithe. And it's the one thing in scripture that the Lord said, test me on this. God says, test me on this. You tithe and watch that I'll provide for you no matter what. And so we want to invite you to give back to God. You can use our website, our secure platform, Victory Anaheim. There's a button, click on the donate button. It's a secure platform where you can set up your either one-time gift or your ongoing. And giving is a way we contribute to the ministry that God's called us to. And so we invite you to give back to God. God bless you as you give.
to you with open hands closer and closer you draw me as a dead summer lay before you again to so come tear down the walls that built up every wall I built up every wall I built up you deserve every piece of my heart every piece of my heart every piece of my heart Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. It's good to be together, God's people. It does my heart well to see all of you, see your, your smiles and seeing everybody coming together. And I'll bet you, you guys are smiling on the other side of the screen. Praise God for that we have a church, that we are a church. Um, the thing we have is each other. So we have a church. We are each other. We are the church. And so we're, we're in week five of, of our current series, which is, is called The Twelve. We're looking at the Twelve Apostles. And the Twelve Apostles are these, these, these followers of Jesus that God used to change the world. That God used to turn the world upside down. And um, so, we're, so we're, we're taking several weeks to look at at these, these 12, these men who, who God used and, and um, what he did through them. I've been taking careful attention to try to put flesh on them so we understand that they're human beings like you and me. It's not like these men were, were, were the cream of the crop, the, the best of the best, the most educated, the wealthiest, the most influential. They were ordinary people that, that God used, and God used them to change the world. And changing the world is, is not something that was only for 2,000 years ago. Changing the world is something that God is doing in the hearts and lives of people every day. And, and, and we're called to be part of God's conspiracy of goodness in the world. And so I want to invite you into this message, which is called, Bring What You Have. Bring What You Have. We're going to look at the Apostle Andrew today. And, and I want to start off by, by telling you just a little bit about Andrew. And, and, and so, so we have kind of a reference point. So like his father... And like his brother Peter, Simon Peter, uh, Andrew was a fisherman and he fished on the Sea of Galilee. He was, a he was also a devoted follower of the desert prophet, also known as John the Baptist. John told Andrew about Jesus and soon Andrew became the first of the 12 to follow Jesus. And, and of all, think about this, of all the billions of followers of Jesus throughout history, of the billions, Andrew gets the mark of being the first of the 12 that followed after Jesus. And, and so he, after that, Andrew convinced his brother, Simon, whom Jesus nicknamed Peter, which means the rock. He convinced his brother, Peter, come and see Jesus. Come and meet Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the one we've been waiting for. And, and, and we find this pattern that Andrew had throughout. Um, we see it all over Scripture. Almost every time Andrew is spoken about, we see him doing this thing where he's bringing people to Jesus. 
Almost every time Andrew's name is mentioned in the scriptures, he's bringing other people to Jesus. And, and so, so first he brought his, his brother, and then he brought the boy with the meal to, to feed the 5,000. And then he brought a group of, of Greek-speaking people to Jesus. And then lastly, he helped Peter bring 3,000 people to Jesus in the book of Acts. According to early church writings, Andrew preached widely throughout the Roman region called Scythia. In, it was an area that today includes modern-day eastern Poland, Ukraine, the Republic of Georgia, southern Russia, and Kazakhstan. So Andrew took the gospel to all of those places after Jesus ascended. Now Andrew's death, Andrew's death was in the year 60 AD. That was 27 years after the first Christian Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on, on the people of God. And Andrew stood before the Roman proconsul named Aegeus, who this, this man, Aegeus, the, the Roman ruler of that area, was angered to see so many people in this region, in his region that he ruled over, that, that they abandoned the Roman religion and they began to follow Jesus. Aegeus asked, when, when Andrew was brought to him, in the year 60 AD, he asked Andrew if he was the same Andrew, I'm quoting here, if he was, quote, the same Andrew that did overthrow the temple of the gods and persuade men to be of that superstitious sect which the Romans of late had commanded to be abolished and rejected. That superstitious sect that he spoke of was Christianity the way of Jesus. Andrew spoke boldly to Aegeus. And, and he said that the Roman gods are idols and not gods at all. They are cruel devils. This is a quote from Andrew. They are cruel devils and enemies to mankind. Aegeus charged Andrew and commanded him not to teach and preach these things anymore, or else Aegeus would sentence him to death by crucifixion. But Andrew said, quote, I would not have preached the honor and glory of the cross if I feared the death of the cross. Amen. That sealed his fate. And the sentence was pronounced. Andrew was nailed to a cross, crucified. The cross was the form of an X, not the same type of cross that Jesus was crucified on. It was the, cross, it was the shape of an X. And so Andrew joined the ranks of other Christians who were martyred because they would not stop bringing people to Jesus. So that cross is often referred to as St. Andrew's cross, the cross in the shape of an X. So let's talk about Andrew's life. The Gospel of John gives us three scenes with, three, with the, the, these common things, in co this one thing in common, that Andrew was the man who brought people to Jesus. And he continued to do so. And so the first one, that I'm going to bring out and, and, and just point out is from John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42. I'm going to go ahead and read those verses. And it says this, The next day, again Andrew was standing with two of his, excuse me, again John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. 
So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, or the rock. You know, the first question that God asked in Scripture, back in the book of Genesis, the very first question that God asked of any people, He asked of of Adam, and He said, Adam, where are you? In Genesis 3, 9. And this is the question for us to answer. Are you hiding from God like Adam and Eve were? Or are you in the family of God? And, 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 or are you, are, you, are you hiding from God? Or are, you in, are you in God's family? Or are you in the world? The second question that God asked was, where is your brother? Where is your brother? And he asked that question of Cain. And Cain, that was in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9, Cain tried to avoid facing the fact that he murdered his brother over jealousy because he was jealous. And, and Cain said to God, am I my brother's keeper? And you can notice anytime that someone answers a question with another question, they're on the defensive. They're on the defensive. And Cain was on the defensive. God, am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes. We have an obligation to our family to tell them about Jesus. Yes, we are our brother's keeper, our sister's keeper. And how will they know the truth about Jesus unless we tell them the truth about Jesus? And and, 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 and even the man who was demon-possessed, who lived in a cemetery that Jesus encountered in the New Testament. After Jesus delivered him from demon possession, a real thing in this world, demon possession, he wanted to travel with Jesus. But Jesus said to him, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Jesus said to the demon-possessed man, once cured, once delivered from demon possession, go and tell your family what the Lord has done for you. And the man obeyed Jesus. And the family or the people who heard his story were amazed. In Mark chapter 5, we'll only know in heaven how many people of his family members and friends came to faith in Jesus. But everyone finds Jesus in a different way. Everyone finds Jesus in a different way. John the Baptist was raised by godly parents who showed him the way to God. And, and then, and then um, they shared their faith with their son at an early age. He opened his heart to God. Andrew and John heard John the Baptist preach, and they were introduced to Jesus that way. Then Andrew went and brought Simon, his brother, to Jesus. Well, at Pentecost, Peter preached the word and 3,000 people were awakened to faith in Jesus at Pentecost. And that's how faith is passed on. Do you see the trail? Oh, from one person to another. And, 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 the, and the word passes on that way. Faith is like that. Someone once said that God doesn't have grandchildren you have to make your faith decision on your own. No matter what your parents, if your parents followed Christ, just because they did doesn't mean that you're a child of God. You have to make your decision. I want Jesus. That's a decision that each of us has to make. But that's how faith is passed on from person to person telling about the grace of God in their lives. Each one is a personal witness to share the good news about Jesus. Now, I'm going to, uh, Josh, are you, if you're doing the, are you doing the Bible lyrics there? The Bible, so um, I dropped the ball here and, and we're going to bypass 
the scripture and go to John chapter 6. Because, uh, sorry about that. So we're going to go to John chapter 6. I apologize, that's a technical thing right there. I, I meant to talk with you before that. But I, I'm going to go to John chapter 6. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 13, John chapter 6. Where Andrew brought a boy and, and his meal to Jesus. All right, in John chapter 6. And the title of this message comes from this passage of John chapter 6. And, and, and where, where, bring what you have. Andrew brought this young boy and, who had fish to feed the crowd of 5,000 people. And, and the basis of this message is, is about bringing what you have to God to do something amazing. And so, so here's what the scripture says in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing to, on the sick. He was healing the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now, the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Jesus, lifting up his, ha- his eyes then and seeing a large crowd that was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And he said this to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they to so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. And there was much grass in this place. So the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So more than 5,000 people, because it's counting the men, 5,000 men, plus the women and children who were there. So it was a lot of people who were there that day. And the, the Lord had this huge congregation in front of him that he was preaching to on this day. And, and on, the, on the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus felt obligated to feed all these people. Jesus himself felt obligated to feed all these people. So he, he also planned to preach a sermon to them about the bread of life. So Jesus wants to preach this sermon, the bread of life, and he wants to be able to provide for them as, as an object lesson in this sermon. So Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen here. He had in mind, but he throws this test out to his disciples. And, and we find that there were three answers that the apostles gave to Jesus that day. And I'm going to give you real quickly those three answers. So there was a big problem and Jesus created the problem. We've got all these people. How are we to feed them? Where are we going to get enough food for all of them? And that's the problem. So the apostles, the first answer the apostles give is send the crowd away. We have no obligation to feed them. Send them home. That was the easy answer and that was the most natural response. Hey, we're not obligated to feed them. Let's send them home. They can go feed themselves. And that would have been a pretty easy, simple solution. The apostles said, hey, Jesus, problem solved. Just send them, send them away. All done. Good to go. Let's get rid of the people and let's, let's get on our way. All right? The people are a nuisance. The people are the problem. Let's just send them away. Jesus goes, yeah, we're not going to do that. Philip comes up with answer number two. Philip, the other, uh, one of the other... Uh, apostles. And Philip comes and he started counting the cost of feeding all these people. So Philip's trying to calculate what it's going to take. And, 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 and he, he was thinking, well, as if a big budget would solve the problem. You know that a big budget is not always the, pro- the, the answer to a problem. If, if you had unlimited resources, it doesn't mean you would have all your problems solved. And, and so Philip is, 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 is bringing a budgetary uh, answer. 
And he's going, Jesus, even, and he talks about the wages of a, of a person for a whole year's wages would not be enough to feed all these people, even for everybody to just get a little bit. And, and, and then um, Jesus goes, yeah, thanks, Philip, but that doesn't help. That doesn't help us solve the problem. Still doesn't help. But then Andrew, well, let me say this. I'll say this. Practical people like Philip are important and needed to run any organization, including a church. But we do need for people to be people of faith and practicality. We have to go, we've got the practical side and we've go, we go, okay, at what point do we trust God? And we, and we move forward in, in spite of our practical limitations. We're going to trust God for something bigger. We're going to trust God for something more. And, 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 and this message, this episode, this situation is a call for us to remember, yes, be practical for sure. But yes, trust God. Yes, have faith in God. Put feet to your faith and see what God does. And, and so, so Andrew gets closer to that, that, that place. The third response was from Andrew. And he'd been walking amongst the crowd. Andrew is walking amongst the crowd, getting to know the people and seeing who was there and what kind of people came. And, and then when Jesus says, how are we going to feed these people? Andrew goes, oh, you know what? As I was among the crowd, I met this little boy and he's got his lunch. He's got bread and fish. And see, see that, that's another personality type that likes to be among the people, that likes to connect with people. And doesn't see people as a nuisance, but is, is actually, um, that thrives by being with people. And, 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 and we, we, we have both kinds of people. We have both kinds of people. And, and, and both serve a purpose. And, and, and here Andrew, he, he met this boy, and he, and he brings the boy to Jesus. And the little boy had come to, to, to hear Jesus, and he had his lunch with him. His mom sent him off with his lunch, and he's got it with him. He brought the boy and his lunch to Jesus. Jesus accepted Andrew's answer. He goes, Andrew, you rock. That's a good solution. Have the people sit down and we're going we're gonna to have a meal right now. We're going to have a shared meal together. And, and, and so, so Andrew was a believer. He didn't know how, but he dared to believe that God would create a how. And the world needs people who believe in the power of God to make a difference. You know, I sat at a conversation this week and I was talking with, 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 with a man about following Jesus. A man in our church about following Jesus. And, and, and I'll, I'll leave his name out of this one. But as we spoke, he said something to me as I was speaking about our role in the world that we are witnesses to God's greatness and, and the world changes when people come to faith in Jesus. The world changes when people put faith to their feet. The world changes when people actually believe what they say they believe and the words aren't just words, but the words are our marching orders. The world changes then. And part of the problem with Christianity today is there are four, so few Christians who actually put feet, feet to their faith. There's so few Christians that put feet to their faith. And, 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 and this, this man said to me, Dave, that sounds great, but that doesn't work in life if I start talking to people about Jesus that way. It doesn't. I go, you can't control what people are going to believe. You can't control what people are going to think about what you share. God just says, go. Do it. Find a way. And, 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 and in the conversation, he reacted to me about three times. Three times. Three times. He reacted to me when I talked about something having to do with faith and trusting God. And, and I said to him, I said, can I, can, I, can I give you some advice as a Christian? And, and the first time, he, he didn't even answer to me. He just went on to the next thing. Like, I could tell he didn't want me to give him advice. Because, because he, he, he sort of started talking about the next thing. And then I said it in a different way. I go, can I give you something that might help? 
And then he finally said, I, I, I think I already know what you're going to say. And I'm like, so you, do you not want me to say it or do you want me to say it? Maybe you know what I'm going to say. Maybe you don't. And finally, he goes, okay, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. And that, that's an important thing. If you don't want to hear it, you're not going to listen. If you don't want to hear it, you're not going to listen. But God works through the open hearted people, those who are open to receiving what God has. And, and, and so we need open hearted Christians who are open to, to following Jesus in our lives. We need open hearted Christians. And so, so I, I don't know, um, I, I'll, I'll say this, Andrew was a believer, he believed big, and the world needs these kinds of Christians who believe in the power of God to make a difference. Too many of us are settling for the way things are when God is calling us to believe in his power to make it better and to bring change. Somebody needs to hear this. I don't know who, but somebody needs to hear this. It's not enough is a fallacy. It's not enough is a fallacy. Andrew did bring the boy with his fish, and he said, but what are they? What, what is the, this little fish and, and loaves to all these people? In other words, it's not enough. It's not enough. But it's not enough is a fallacy for the child of God. God's people are called to live by faith. And there are plenty of times when, when the resources needed to make something happen don't add up. We all will experience times where it doesn't add up in our lives. You have experienced it and you've walked away. But you've probably missed some blessings because you, you, you believed it's not enough. You probably missed God's work because you said it's not enough. I know I have. I've missed the boat on many occasions because I said it's not enough. And I finally began to believe that, that we have everything we need in the name of Jesus to accomplish everything that God wants us to accomplish. We have what we need. And you have more than you know. And, and, and so, um, I, I, I'll, I'll even say this, I'll connect it to us as a church. I love to tell the story about what we're doing as a church and, and, and how, how we're, we're a small church and, and we're building this, this grand ministry center, grand for us. Some would go, oh, it's only 38,000 square feet. Well, it's grand for us. It's something big for us. It's a big undertaking for us. <laughs> it's a big deal. Go by 227. The gate was open. They were working on it when I drove by this morning. And, and, and stuff's happening there. As there as it, the, what's happening on the property, just leveling out the property, doing the grading. It's preparation for what's to come. It's going to lie dormant for a little time before we start building in the first quarter of next year. But I, I want to say this first quarter, possibly into the second quarter by the time we start, but um, more than bricks, we call this initiative, is a big deal. And you go, we don't have enough. We don't have enough money to make it happen, to see it to completion. We don't have enough people to build this thing. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. Every one of those s objections that you could bring up is true. Every objection you could bring up on why we shouldn't have done this is true. We could, by the numbers, create a case for how off we are on multiple times over, I'll say it that way, multiple times over. But the key is, is God calling us to do this? Is God in this, what we're doing? And, 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 and I believe, yes, God is in this. And I've seen already God has done things that, that overcame um, barriers that were in the way. And, 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 I'll, and I'll also say this. If you could accomplish whatever you're going to accomplish without God, if you could do it on yourself, then God's not even in it. God's not even there. You're doing it yourself. Everything about your life, if you can accomplish it on your own, you don't even need God because you can do it on your own, right? 
What do we need God for if, 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 if there's no such thing as faith? We need God because we believe bigger than what we have. We need God because we believe bigger than where we are. We, be, we need God because we believe. We are people of the book. We are people who believe the book. And we are people who say those stories of old, we're connected to these, to these disciples. We're connected to these apostles who took big risk. So God can do more with a little bit than you can do with a lot on your own. If you have a lot of resources on your own, you can accomplish some things. But with a very little bit, God can do more. And so, and so the question is, do we believe that? If we believe that, then let's live it. Let's live it. We have to be people willing to put ourselves out there, even if there's risk. You don't overcome barriers without taking risks. You don't overcome barriers without taking risks. And it's not about you. It's about God and his plans. And God wants to accomplish much through us. So let's go with God and let's do what he called us to do. Let's go like Jesus said, go. Go into all the earth making disciples. Go into all the earth baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go into all the earth. We need to see some more people baptized. We we're like, man, we got to get, where, where are we going to baptize? I don't know, but when people are ready to be baptized because they're putting their faith in Jesus, we'll figure it out. Amen. We'll figure it out. Let's, let's figure it out. Go lead people to Jesus. Take people to Jesus. Be like Andrew. Leading people to Jesus. The, la the last thing I want to tell you about, about Andrew. Andrew, Jesus gave nicknames to several of the disciples. Simon became Peter, which means the rock. James and John became the sons of thunder. To Levi, he gave the name Matthew, which means the gift of God. But Andrew didn't get a nickname. Andrew, he just called Andrew. Andrew was just Andrew. And you know what Andrew means? Andrew means manly. Andrew means manly. I want to say this. The manliest and the womanliest thing that we can do is to have a burden for people, to care about their souls and to bring them to Jesus. It's the manliest and the womanliest thing that we can do is to care about people's souls and bring them to Jesus. Bring them to Jesus. Andrew bought, brought people to Jesus. He brought what he had, believing that it was enough in the hands of God. May we live in such a way. I want to I close out this message in a word of prayer. and I just want to leave some time for us to be able to respond to God right now as the worship team comes. And we want to be able to just respond to God. Just over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. I want to invite you to, to, to pray. Some of you, you've wanted to take some faith risks with God. You've wanted to believe big. But something's held you back. Something has held you back. And, and, and I don't know what's holding you back. But in the name of Jesus, let today be that change where you say yes to God. I'm no longer going to be held back. I'm no longer going to re be reserved when it comes to trusting God. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to take the risks I need to take. And so I want to invite you to pray with me right now. If you want to take that risk to go with God, or if you want to put your faith in Jesus, pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, we trust you and we need you. I pray, Jesus, that you would come into my life and lead me right now. Lead me to take faith risks. Lead me to trust you. Lord, give me faith. Take my little bit of faith. And I just am willing to put it in your hands right now. I give it to you, Lord. I give you my life. Lead me in the name of Jesus. Amen. Are you hurting, broken within?
again Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come the day there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you feel let down, please rise. Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord.
you know. Thank you, worship team. That was beautiful. I love that song. So beautiful. A call to bow down before Jesus, our King. He's worthy of us bowing down before Him. It's been good to be together, people of God. It's been really good to be together. You look good. I can see your smiles through those masks. <laughs> I can see them. <laughs> the smile shows in your eyes. Bless everyone in the name of Jesus. I want to send you out with this blessing to remember that you are the light of the world. In the name of Jesus, you have this calling to go out and be light in dark places. The world needs light right now. The world needs light. The light of God's love that you bring. And I don't know what it's going to look like this week, but I believe this, that as we as God's people yield to Him and say, Lord, use me, that He will use us as to bring light into dark places. He will use us this week. There's somebody in your life, maybe more than one, but at least one person in your life who needs the light of God's love. And I implore you, be blessed and go out and bring the love of God into people's hearts and people's lives because you're meant for it. You're equipped for it. You're called to it. So go out and do it in Jesus' name. Be blessed. If you put your faith in Jesus today, please send us an email to info at victoryanaheim.org so we can put some resources in your hands to help you walk with Jesus. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Sing with us once more. Is it time to